I am so honored to be up here. I really am. This is like a dream come true for me to preach at the Father's House. The Father's House is my favorite church in the world. And uh, people have heroes of the faith, right? People say like uh, Smith Wigglesworth and all these people. My heroes of the faith all come from this church. So today I'm really, really honored. And it's my birthday. So it's like a birthday present from Jesus, right? I'm going to let you into a little discussion that I was having with my wife and see what you guys, what what your take on this is, right? So I had the revelation that when you turn one, it's your first birthday, but you've lived and you're one years old, right? You've completed your full year. So although it's my 35th birthday today, I'm not turning 35, I'm actually turning 36. I've lived 35 complete years, and I'm now living my 36th year. Is it just me? Mind's blown? Drop mic? Let's go home. (laughs) Yeah, I know, Nicole. Calm down. It's all right. All right, so... (laughs) <laughs> that being said, I can stand up here and pop jokes all morning, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to promote Jesus, and that's what I want to give my life to, and that's what I want to spend my time doing. So how about we do that? You guys with me? Yeah. All right, so we're going to dive into some uh, scripture first, and we're going to start in Matthew 16. Uh, and Matthew 16 recently has probably be- become my favorite chapter in the Gospels, because if you read the whole thing, it really breaks down what it is to be a Christian, It kind of shows you what not to do, and then it shows you what to do. So in its simplest form, it's a really good chapter to kind of read over numerous times and apply it to your life and make sure that it kind of fits with where you're at, right? Uh, So I'm going to read a few few of the verses, and then we'll stop for a little while. I'm going to make some points, and we'll go back into it, okay? So Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, there'll be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and a sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah. And then he left and went away. Okay, so firstly, let me explain a little bit about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, okay? So these guys are the religious leaders for Judaism at the time of Jesus, but they're very different. So the Sadducees uh, were kind of like the aristocrats. They were the wealthy people that came from position and power, and the Sadducees actually held the most amount of seats in the Sanhedrin. What's really weird, though, is I found out that they don't believe in a lot of the things that the scriptures say. They don't believe in angels and demons. They didn't believe in uh, life after death. They didn't believe that God was like interactive with their life today. So in a nutshell, they believed in the law as it was written, and they believed they had to uphold the law as a behavior. And that was it, right? And then the Pharisees, now they believed way more in the scriptures. They believed the whole thing, right? And they had less seats in the Sanhedrin, and they were more for the people. So the people, for the most part, actually liked the Pharisees. They didn't really like the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't do anything for them. They were just about politics, wealth, and money. The Pharisees were more about the people. The the issue that the Pharisees had, though, is they implemented all these oral traditions. So through generations of mankind and families and things like that, they passed down these oral traditions, basically saying, this is how you abide by the Scriptures. We're going to set these things up in our lives, boundaries in our lives, things in our lives to make sure that we're adhering to what the scriptures say. But over time, what had happened is these oral traditions had become just as important, if not more important, than the scripture. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees had their own systems that were going. And what happens is they hear about Jesus. And Jesus comes and rocks their whole system, turns it upside down on its head. In the uh, New Testament, there is like recorded 37 miracles that Jesus performed, right? Up to this point right now, he has already performed 25 of those miracles. So they've seen him. They've seen his power. They've seen what he can do. At this point, he's healed, he's cast out demons, and he's provided things from heaven for people uh, with thousands and thousands of witnesses. And he's also done it in synagogues, in front of Pharisees. So they shouldn't be asking for another sign, period. He's shown them who he is. He's revealed to them who he is. 
part of the issue here is they're coming to him, basically, reading between the lines a little bit here, saying, hey, Jesus, we're the authority here. We're the religious leaders here. Who are you to be showing up telling people that we're wrong? Who are you to be showing up and not adhering to our oral traditions? Who are you to be showing up and not adhering to the law as we say it should be adhered to? So why don't you go ahead and show me a sign and then we'll decide if you are who you say you are. We'll decide if we back your play or not. Jesus' response to that is you perverse and evil generation. And he says you will get no sign. Again, he's already performed 25 of them. The other interesting thing is he goes on to provide 12 more after this. But he tells them, you will get no sign, apart from the sign of Jonah. And I'm just going to make a little side plug here, because I haven't researched this enough, but when I was looking at some com um, commentaries on these scriptures and kind of going where, where I wanted to go with the sermon, people say that the sign of Jonah is a sign of the crucifixion. He was in the fish for three days. He was spat out, right? So I believe here in this context, he's saying, that's going to be your sign. You'll see the crucifixion, and you'll see me raised again. Right? But other than that, I'm not performing for you. And he leaves. Okay? Then uh, Jesus gets on a boat, or he's with, he's with his disciples. He's going to the other side. We're going to pick up in verse 5. So this is still Matthew 16. This is the next verse. Okay? And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They have be began to discuss this among themselves, saying, he said this because we don't have any bread. I always love that verse. Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss amongst yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you picked up? Or the seven loaves that fed the 4,000 and how many large basketfuls you picked up? How is it you do not understand that I do not speak to you about concerning bread, but be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Okay, so let me just put this in a little bit of context here of how I'm seeing this, right? So Jesus has just been tested by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he's gone, you guys are missing it. I'm not going to perform the sign. You've had a sign. You're not the authority. You don't know who I am. I'm out of here. Your problem right? Gets on the boat with his disciples. These are the guys that have inst intimate relationship with Jesus. They should know who he is. And he's like, really guys, you too? You're missing it too? You think I care about bread? I bade thousands and thousands of bread, loaves of bread and fed thousands of people. You think I'm relying on you and your traditions to provide bread for me? You're really missing who I am? Do you see where, got, where I'm getting at? So we've got these two responses, right? We've got this response of the Sadducees and the Pharisees that completely refuse to believe that Jesus is who he says he is because he completely conflicts with their religion and their way of doing things. That's option one of how they respond to Jesus. But option two, and I think this is where I have fallen into this category, and I'm wondering if there's other people in this room from time to time that might feel that they've fallen into this category. I'm doing everything right. I'm going to church. I'm with Jesus. I've encountered Jesus. I know he's real. I walk with Jesus. But sometimes I miss it. And sometimes I get tied up on, how am I going to pay my bills, Jesus? How am I, how am I going to do this, Jesus? What about, why won't you heal this person, Jesus? Jesus, why won't you perform a sign for me so that I know you're real? Why won't you do what I want you to do? Why won't you let me be the authority, Jesus? And we fall into that category without meaning to, completely accidentally, right? So I want to talk a little bit about my story and how I encountered Jesus. So uh, in my early 20s, I was uh, addicted to substance abuse, substances, right? I was lost. I was broken. Uh, life had pretty much beat me down, trampled over me, and kicked me to the curb. Uh, I hated myself. Uh, and I got to the point where I just wanted out. I was hopeless. I'd lost all hope. And my mum, who was honestly the, the biggest rock in my life that I've ever had, <laughs> um, she never gave up. She always prayed for me, right? And she'd encountered Jesus a few years before. We weren't raised as Christians, but she'd encountered Jesus. And she was who I would go to to bail me out. Like, mum, I spent all my money on stuff I shouldn't be spending my money on, and now I can't pay for my car loan. Can you help? Mum, I owe people money. I need money. Can you help? I can't put gas in my car to get to work. Can you help? And she would. 
probably to her own demise, but she would. She'd help me all the time, right? Uh, but eventually she caught wise. And she said, all right, Christian, I'm going to help you. But I'll only help you if you come to church, right? And in my head, I'm like, deal, right? I go there. I get in. Probably some wooden pews and some priests. Get out of there. Job done. Bills paid. On we go, right? Thought it was going to be that easy. It didn't turn out to be that easy. So the church I went into is a church called Lifespring Church in Reading, and they're very similar to us in many, many ways. They're different because they're British and they're different, but you know what I mean. <laughs> we can go into those differences, but that'll take the rest of my time, so I'll move on. But what happened for me is I encountered God the very first time I walked into church. So I walked into there, and I saw these people, and I kind of froze and I felt this presence, and the best way that I've learned to describe it was it felt like I'd been drowning my entire life, and all of a sudden I could breathe, right? And it was like, I, in that moment, I knew everything was going to be okay, right? And I saw, the, I saw these guys worship, and I was looking around at them, and I was thinking, these guys have something that I don't have. I need what they have. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. I didn't know who Jesus was. I had thought that maybe God was real. And this had proved it to me. So at this, that moment on, I never doubted that God was real again. I'd experienced him. I'd met him, right? Now, the problem was, I would go to church, and I would get that experience all the time. I would leave church. Nothing changed. And this went on for a couple of years. And I continued to, to drink, to use drugs. I continued to fall down the same traps that I fell down. And the truth was, is I was still miserable. I was still broken. I was still hurt. Nothing had really changed other than the fact I knew God was real. Well, my revelation while I'm studying for this is because the reason being is because I wanted to fit God into my understanding of who God was. I wanted God to come in and heal me. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to do anything different. I didn't want to uh, find out who he said he was. I didn't want to read scriptures and actually find out what the truth is. I thought I knew better. I wanted to put God into my understanding of what's good and what's bad. I wanted to put God into my understanding of what he should do and what he shouldn't do. So I had this expectation and I was waiting and I was praying, God, come heal me. Take away my ailments, Lord. Take away this addiction. Take everything away. Make life easy for me, Jesus. And then I would get angry at him. Time was going on. Time was going on. I was getting angry. I was like, why won't you come do this for me, Jesus? Do you not see that I'm coming to church? Do you not see that I'm trying? Do you not see that I'm desperate for you? And nothing happened. And I was almost at a point where I was willing to walk away because I'd been following Jesus for about two years and I decided, man, this doesn't work. I believe that Jesus could, but you know what? I can't do enough to give him what I need. A little side note is for the last 18 months, I've been at the gym and I've been working out and I've been trying to transform the way my body looks. And I've been working really, really hard to do that. And Jesus was showing me this morning as I was just running over this and prepping for myself and thinking about my early Christianity. If I'd have treated my Christianity, or if I, sorry, if I'd have treated the gym this time around like I treated my early Christianity, then I would have seen zero results. I would have gone and sat in the gym and gone, bicep machine, why won't you give me biceps machine? <laughs> treadmill, why won't you burn my calories, treadmill? And I'd have just shouted at all the machines and sat there and tried to picture that I was, I was better off. And then I'd have left the gym. Why won't it work for me? So that was my early Christianity. That's exactly what it was. I sat in church whining and crying about why Jesus won't fit my expectation of who he is and what he should do for me. And unfortunately, guys, this is, this is uh, common. This is how a lot of people live their Christianity. This is why a lot of people are stuck. This is why a lot of people have yet to encounter the cross. This is why for most people, they don't have a Christianity that works. Because they're not willing to say, maybe I'm wrong. They're not willing to say, hey, you tell me what the truth is, and I'll change and transform my life based on what you say, and I'll do what you tell me to do. So in England, uh, 2015, the father's house, praise the Lord, sends a team to Redden, England. And I sit in front of Steve, and he tells me, if you follow me for two years, your life will be better. And I remember being so mad at this guy. I just tried Jesus for two years, and I was ready to quit, right? 
And I'm thinking, who are you? You don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. And if I'm honest, guys, this is what I'm thinking. I'll be real for a second. Typical American coming to my country telling me that he knows better. Just so you guys know, I love you. I actually became American recently, so I can say it, all right? That was my attitude. It's just like, who is this guy? How dare he? He doesn't know me. He doesn't know what I've been through. He doesn't know where I come from. And he just sits there telling me that in two years, my life could be different, and I've just tried Jesus for two years, and I don't think it works. And I left all offended. It probably didn't help the fact that I was high, and I kind of thought he knew, so I was all paranoid. That didn't help, just so you guys know. It's not the best way to start a relationship with your future pastor. But it worked, so... Anyway, he said that. I left. I left offended. But at the same time, there was a noticeable difference in my life. I had lost hope before, and I left with hope. What if he is right? What if he can help me? And right now, I don't really have anything to lose, because I'm at the point where I want to end this whole thing anyway. So what I did, guys, and this was my response, is I went and got a visa, I quit my job, I left my country. Behind in my country, I left my family, my friends, and everybody I knew. I sold my car, I got on a plane, and I came to Oroville, California, knowing no one or nothing. Wow. And that decision changed my life for the course of my life. That is when I said, Jesus, you, I remember getting on a plane and saying, okay, Jesus, you got six months. Because I was coming to do level one of school. I said, you got six months, but this was my promise. And I stand by this. I said, Jesus, I'll give you 110%. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'm not going there to fake my way through this. I'm not going there to appear that I've got everything figured out. If I was going to do that, I'll stay right here and do it right here around the people that I know and love. I'm not putting myself in this position to waste six months. You've got six months, Jesus. And if you don't work, even still, I'm going to come home. I'm never going to follow you. And I'm just going to carry on living my life. And I'm done. I'm out. And that decision and that openness with him and that dialogue of I'll give you 110%, whatever you tell me to do, radically changed my life. <laughs> so I want to uh, read you another scripture too. So we're going to go into Acts. Actually, you know what? Before I do that, I want to just point out a few things, okay? So... Just a reminder, we got the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were completely refused, all right? They completely refused to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And then we've got the disciples that got it wrong numerous times, okay? Uh, we got Peter that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. We got Peter that also denied Jesus, that, you know, publicly. Uh, the disciples were reprimanded for talking amongst themselves about how great and fantastic and who was the best of them. And then ultimately, in the uh, time that Jesus needed them most, they completely fled, right? Now, the other thing with the Pharisees and Sadducees, not only did they completely deny who Jesus was, they hated him so much that they took him and put him through ultimate torture. They had him beaten. They had him whipped. They accused him. They uh, put a crown of thorns on his head, and they drove nails through his feet and his hands and hung him on a cross to suffocate and die. That was their response to who Jesus was. The disciples just got it wrong numerous times, but tried and tried and tried. I want to read what I, what I believe to be the best response that we can have to Jesus. And it comes from uh, Paul the, the Apostle. Okay? So for those of you that don't know, Paul was a Pharisee. He was the up-and-coming, shining star. He was the guy that was all about it. And he was going to the Sanhedrin post Jesus' crucifixion, and he was trying to stump out any Christianity. He was going and asking them from letters to hunt them down, find them, catch them, bind them, and kill them. He wanted to extinguish this thing before it became the problem that he thought it would become. Now, in, in Acts 9, verse 1, I'm going to read some scriptures here, right? So, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest asked for letters from him for the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. 
And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Okay, we're going to stop there for a minute. So he doesn't know Jesus. But he encounters him and within seconds, he knows who he is. And what I mean by that is, who are you? Lord. Within seconds, he recognized the authority and the power of who he just encountered. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit for the sake of time, and we're going to pick up some verses further down, but I want you guys to bear that in mind. So uh, he falls down, he loses his sight, and Jesus uh, tells him and sends him to one of his people, right? Uh, Ananias. So in verse 13, this is where we're going to pick up. Ananias answered him, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Let's just pause there for a second. That's verse 17 we'll be picking up. Who wants to sign up for that in this room? I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. So this is the opposite of what I believed in my early Christianity. Come bless me, Jesus. Come and make my life fantastic. Let's have rainbows outside the window every morning and the birds chirping. And I will want to walk on streets of gold and have money fall out of the trees. And I want to be fit and healthy because you waved your magic wand. That's like the sales pitch of Christianity right now. And it's not true. If that's what you believe, you're missing it. You're missing who he is. You're falling into those same traps that these people have fell into. That's not the truth. The truth is, is you might suffer for his namesake. The truth is, is he might ask you to sacrifice everything you know and love. He might, there's a cost. There is a cost. Let's pick it up in verse 17, please. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. He had the revelation of who Jesus was. His life was dedicated to Judaism. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was going to hunt down and kill anyone who proclaimed the name of Jesus. He was going to squash it out. He was done. He wasn't going to let that happen on his watch. He encounters Jesus within seconds. Lord. And then his response, as soon as Jesus ordains him, as soon as Jesus gives him, puts him back on his feet and fills him with the Holy Spirit, is to go to the synagogues. That's where the Pharisees are, the ones that nail Jesus to the cross. And he walks in there bold and brave and says, Jesus is the Son of God. That is the correct response to who Jesus is. Are you guys hearing me? Can I get an amen on this or what? So we're going to take a couple of minutes here. We're going to get into some worship. Uh, and we're going to do an altar call here in a minute. And I want you guys thinking about this. Okay. I don't know that there'd be many people that'd be sat in this church that maybe feel like they're a Pharisee. But think about it. Where have you demanded a sign? Where have you expected Jesus to wave his magic wand for you? Where has that been part of your life? Where I think maybe more and where I've definitely identify is, is the disciples that at times completely miss who Jesus is. And they get tied up. We live in this worldly system. We need money to pay our bills. We need money to go to the grocery store. There's a system that we have to operate in in Christians that isn't always his system. There's an earthly system that doesn't always acknowledge who God and Jesus are. And we get tied up in this. And we worry about mortgages and houses and careers and retirement funds. And none of these are bad things, guys. These are not bad things. Until they distract you from who Jesus is. The minute that they rob you that maybe Jesus isn't who he says he is because he won't wave his magic wand and give me what I want. Stop drop and roll all right the response that we should all be going for is he is lord he is the son of god 
And I'm going to spend the rest of my life proclaiming his name to anybody that will listen. And whether you're called into marketplace or whether you're called into full-time ministry, whatever your thing is, you do that. Some of us, I feel called to full-time ministry and I get to be blessed to do this every day. And other people feel that they're called into the marketplace. That's fine. That doesn't matter. I'm never going to, you know, critique one or the other. It doesn't matter as long as you're doing this. Does that make sense? There's one more thing I want to share, and this applies maybe more to if you're new in church, okay? When I encountered God, I spent the two years expecting Him to fit into my way of doing things, right? And it held me back. Steve will tell you that when he was 18 years old, he went to a concert and there was an altar call, and he said, I'm going to go up to the altar call and I'm going to find out if he's real. And if he's real, I'll follow him. So my uh, urge to you guys, if you're feeling right now that you want to find out if he's real, do what Steve did. Don't do what I did. Don't be a guy that would sit in the gym shouting at the treadmill. All right? But be someone that's willing to come after Jesus and let him transform you. Let your life be night and day different than it ever was before. Let him come into your heart. Let him reveal to you the truth. Get that love of the heavenly father where he sees you, knows you, loves you, has a plan and a purpose for your life. And come and receive what your heavenly father has for you to receive. Okay, so there's many things here. Can I get the ministry team to come up? Guys, we have men that come to our male pastors over here on my right. That's the culture of the Father's house and the women passes over here on my left. So ladies to the women, please. Men to the men. And if you fall in the category of you want to find out if he's real, then come and ask one of these pastors if he's real. They'll lead you through that. And you can find out right now if he is who he says he is and if he's real. If you're sitting there and you're feeling like maybe you tick one of these boxes and maybe that there's a better response that you can give to Jesus. Maybe you fell short. Maybe you abandoned him. Maybe you made mistakes. Maybe you asked, oh man, I forgot the bread. Right? But the good news is, look what he did with those disciples. Look who they became. They founded the early church. The Holy Spirit came in them and everything changed. So close your eyes, bow your head. I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to respond this morning. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much that you see us. Thank you so much that you know us. I ask right now that you just reveal the truth of yourself and the truth of Jesus to us right now. I pray right now that we would feel an increase of your Holy Spirit, that we would have a tangible experience of you right here, right now. We would feel your presence and we would be forever changed. We want more of you, Jesus. We want our traditions and our cultures to bow down to who you say you are. We want to respond to your authority, Jesus. We want to respond to your truth, Jesus. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe so that you never miss another video or live stream. And if you'd like to support the Father's House, just click the Give button. Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you soon.